I'm not a big fan of ownership of a disease, like saying it's my Crohn's disease, it's my ulcerative colitis, it's my bad back, it's my bad thyroid. Like, don't give yourself ownership of that because we say like, that's my girlfriend, that's my dog, that's my t-shirt, that's my fill in the blank, right? What if you said that's the girlfriend or that's the dog, right? You'd get in trouble. I'd get in trouble if I said that, you know what I mean? So it's like, don't give yourself ownership of your symptoms because you're not intending to keep your Crohn's disease. You're not intending to keep the symptoms that you're experiencing. You might have genes for symptoms, for a certain condition, for a certain label that you've been given but it doesn't mean that you need to experience that. If you are experiencing symptoms and you are and you are diagnosed and labeled with Crohn's disease, then that means how you're living your life right now is directly competing with your biology. How you're living your life right now is directly competing against the genes that you have and is quote, turning on or turning off those genes for Crohn's disease. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Craig McCloskey. I'm a master certified health coach. And in today's conversation, we're gonna be talking all things Crohn's disease. Now there's many different types of irritable bowel diseases, but Crohn's disease in particular, I'm gonna lay out what it is, when it was first discovered, who's most susceptible, and it lay out a holistic protocol for you to follow. Because if you're someone out there with uh, digestive issues, uh, maybe it's idiopathic. Maybe you don't know what's causing it. You don't know what it is. Um, maybe you suspect it's celiac disease, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, some form of uh, irritable bowel disease. Uh, this is for you because I'm going to lay out a complete uh, protocol talking about foods to avoid, best foods to include, supplements, and lifestyle practices because odds are you've been to your doctor, dietitian, or other health expert, and they've just given you maybe a list of foods that are very bland, high fiber foods that are typically like pastas and rices and things like that, that uh, honestly can just aggravate it even more. But the science that I have today that I'm going to present is just going to completely blow you away. You're gonna love this conversation. And if you want any more practical you know, takeaways or a tangible plan to follow, I highly recommend checking out my free seven day autoimmune reset challenge. That is basically everything inside this protocol, but it's a plan. It has over 12 hours worth of video content. Just like this, I break down what autoimmune disease is, who's most susceptible. I have a lot of content in there talking about the best foods with a lot of science backed recommendations, as well as certified personal trainer, uh, formulated workout programs and a dietitian formulated cookbook and guided meal plan with a lot of other things like that. There's a community in there. So that's what I definitely check out. If you like this video, you like this content, uh, the things in there are basically a reflection of that and the community in there is amazing. We have hundreds and hundreds of individuals that have gone through this and have seen so many amazing results. So that is something to check out after this video is over. So with all that being said, let's jump into your holistic Crohn's disease protocol. So starting out this conversation, we need to ask the question, what is Crohn's disease? What, what even is Crohn's disease and how do you know if you have it? So like I mentioned previously, Crohn's disease is a form of irritable bowel disease, which is a chronic inflammatory condition of the GI tract. Crohn's disease is autoimmune in origin, which means autoimmune, if you're not familiar with this already, that just means that's your own immune system attacking your own tissues. That's as simple and as cartoonish as it gets. You ingest food or for some reason, there's many known causes, but there isn't one definitive cause. But for some reason, the individual's own immune system starts attacking their own tissues, whether that is Hashimoto's, which is the immune system attacking the thyroid gland, celiac disease where it attacks the small intestine, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis where it attacks the joints, uh, type 1 diabetes where it attacks the beta cells in the pancreas. Uh, there's so many different forms of autoimmune disease, but Crohn's disease is autoimmune in origin and it presents as chronic inflammation primarily in the last part of the small intestines, which is the distal end of the small intestine and the first part of the large intestines. Now this is known to be quote unquote patchy and can affect any part of the digestive tract. 
So you might have seen images. I can post a picture here. You can see the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, these two kind of get used interchangeably, but they're completely different, uh, but they're both autoimmune. They're both a form of irritable bowel disease, but Crohn's is more of that patchy. It can be anywhere throughout the, the digestive tract, but typically, like I said, it's towards the distal end of the small intestine and it's towards the first part of the, the colon, whereas ulcerative colitis is more towards the distal end of the colon, the, the end, like the, the rectum of the, the large intestine. And so Crohn's disease, if you are somebody out there that has Crohn's disease or suspects you might have something going on like Crohn's disease, please know that you're not alone. You're not alone in this because uh, reports have over 780,000 Americans alone have diagnosed Crohn's disease. That's about the same amount, you know, maybe a little bit more than the amount of Americans that die of heart disease every year in the United States. You know, so this is a leading cause of, um, this is a leading autoimmune condition and it affects a lot of people. So please know that you're not alone in this. And there are so many things that you can do to take control of your health today. And if you've been dealing with this for months to years to decades, even, you know, so many, so many people deal with this for decades and they don't get the relief that they need to because they go to their doctor, they go to their health professional and there's really minimal discussion about food. There's minimal discussions about the types of food that you're eating, uh, how it can be impacting you know, your symptoms and your flare ups, because this is what, this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem because the thing is your digestive tract is literally there for food. Like your food, what you're eating is going through your colon and your small intestine. Of course it's going to impact it, but the messaging in the mainstream, anytime you turn on a TV show, anytime there's a commercial, you'll see, you know, commercials for medications, Humira, I mean, there's so many commercials about medication saying, you know, take this, you get it injected and so many percent of individuals see relief in their symptoms. And it's like, there's so much that is going untold in this entire story, but what is the root cause of it? And that part of the conversation is not being addressed. And in this conversation, I want to lay out science that addresses some of these root causes and that I have proven in my programs taking on a, you know, a dietary approach and a holistic lifestyle approach that a lot of my clients have seen dramatic relief and remission of their symptoms just through lifestyle intervention. And now I'm not saying that you're going to experience that. This is a unique individual uh, case and you have to keep working with your doctor. So there's a little medical disclaimer there, but please know that if you're coming in here, you have more control than you think. It's not my responsibility. It's not your doctor's responsibility when it comes to your health. It's your responsibility. My job is just to give you the information and just tell you and, and just kind of let you know that there are other options out there. It shouldn't even be considered alternative options because how you live your life matters and that should be the number one option. Alternative options should be the medications. Alternative options should be like, like, like the things that aren't fundamental because when we exhaust all natural options through how we live our life, the food, the sleep, the movement, the stress, the light, the air, uh, the relationships, all these things are what make up who we are. That should be the fundamentals. That should be the basic building blocks that we go to. That should be like the gold standard of uh, symptom and uh, disease prevention and cure uh, potentially. Then the alternative options, when that stuff doesn't work, then we can jump to medications and pharmaceutical drugs. Now that's just my opinion and a lot of people out there see it the same way, but this program is really trying to address like what's going on, how can we change the diet and lifestyle around so you can live a higher quality life. And so with that being said, when was Crohn's disease first discovered? Now in our world today, uh, chronic disease has just skyrocketed in the past 100 to 200 years really in the past like 100 to 50 years, like it's just boomed, it's skyrocketed. Now also within the past 100 to 50 years, you know, in the past two to three generations, we've also just kind of boomed our species. You know, you look in 1970, in the year 1970, if you were born around then, if your 
45 to 50 years older or more, you've been alive long enough to see the world's population double. Think about that. In the year 1970, the world's population of humans was about 3.5, 3.6 billion humans. And now in 2021, the world's population is that of almost 8 billion. So we've doubled our population just in the past 50 years alone. Then in the year 1900, it was between 1 and 2 billion. So you can see like just in the past 120 years, we've just, you know, 100%, 200%, 300% increase in our world's population. In the year 1700, that seems like a long time ago, but it was just the blink of an eye as far as like uh, humanity is concerned, right? Humans have been evolving for, you know, depending on which anthropology uh, evidence you look at, 300,000 uh, as far as like Homo sapiens, uh, and Homo erectus, Homo habilis, uh, you can go back to Australopithecus, about four to five million years, humans have really been evolving. And then you can see on the map, I'll post a picture right here, you can see how thin the line was as far as like humans. And then all of a sudden in you know the year 18 and 1900, it just skyrocketed. And that's amazing in so many ways. But also as I talk about in a lot of my other videos in my Coffee with Craig series that I have, that has so many unintended consequences, you know, positive and bad. So it's like, what is that doing and what's going on? But when you look like per capita, there wasn't that much Crohn's disease. But now it's like when you look at the ratio of like how many humans we have to how much chronic disease we have, it's, it's just absurd the amount of chronic disease we have per like 8 billion humans. It's like, I mean, three fourths of the, the you know, population in the United States is overweight or obese. Um, hundreds of thousands of individuals, if uh, millions, millions of individuals have some form of uh, autoimmune condition. I think it's like 25 million plus, 50 million plus Americans have some form of autoimmune condition. It's just absolutely absurd. And like, what's causing that? And there's so many different factors that go into it. But just in the past 100 years was Crohn's disease first discovered. And all the time before that, you know, autoimmune conditions were rare. But there's so many factors that go into this that I do a deep dive and talk about that in my my free seven day challenge that you can access clicking the link below. Now Crohn's disease was first described in the year 1932, so not even a hundred years ago, by three different doctors. Burl Crohn, Leon Ginsberg, and Gordon D. Oppenheimer. And this is information, this information right here is from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And so at this time, any disease in the small intestine was thought to be intestinal tuberculosis. Now these doctors, what they did is they collected data from 14 different patients with symptoms of abdominal cramps, diarrhea, fever, and weight loss, which showed that the symptoms were not the result of tuberculosis or any other type of known disease at that time. What they did is they described a new disease entity, which was first called regional ileitis, and now it later became known as Crohn's disease. So this is when it was first described. And so since then, in the past like 50 to 70 years, uh, as you've been able to see, like 780,000 Americans have Crohn's disease. So what has been going on? We just need to take a step back and ask this fundamental question or ask a few different fundamental questions. But what has really changed in the way we live our lives uh, now as humans, as our species, what has changed in the way we live our lives now in the past 70 to 80 years compared to the way we've lived it before that? And I talk about this in my other videos uh, quite a bit, but when you look at this, I'm not saying this is causal. I'm not saying that, that the way that our different environment now, uh, that these things are causal by any means, there's just an association between this. And so foods were just invented, you know, like vegetable oils were just invented in the past 100 years. All of these man-made foods were just invented. We have grocery stores that were invented in 1916. So now we have the ability to have food shipped from all over the world. We have uh, not just whole foods shipped from all over the world, but we have just access to even whole foods that you might not be able to get in your local environment. I'm drinking coffee that I cannot grow here in my local environment. That's being imported from all over the world. Um, not to mention, then we have the sugar consumption uh, and foods that have sugar and vegetable oils and we have meats being raised completely different. Animals are raised differently, fed antibiotics and hormones, um, you know, in feedlot farms. So that changes the composition of 
their meat. Not to mention where we get our meat from is usually from fast food uh, restaurants. And it's just like so much has changed. And before that, before this time in the 1900s, really humans ate what they could get in their local environment. And that's, I mean, that's as basic as it gets. Now, of course, like we had ships because planes were invented in the early 1900s with the Wright brothers taking the first flight then. Uh, cars like the, the 1908 Model T. So cars have really just kind of been pushing the culture. And it's like you add on top of all these other inventions. At that same time, the human population boomed because of these inventions and technologies. Uh, so it's like all these things have their place and their value. But it's just saying like, our environment, the environment that, the only environment that we know, you know, because we've been born into this and all we know are the few decades that we've walked this earth, uh, is completely different and it's abnormal and it's not what our genes expect because we have the same genes as we would from our ancestors that lived just a few generations to go to tens of thousands of years ago. We have the same genes because it takes a very long time for our genes to change, but yet our environment has changed overnight as far as uh, you know humanity is concerned, as I've already previously talked about. And this is a huge issue because this is gonna lead me into this next question when it comes to autoimmune conditions and Crohn's disease in particular. But what is the cause of Crohn's disease? Now, no one knows the definitive one cause, but what we have really narrowed it down to, uh, and this is according to a recent study, but there's this autoimmune triad and you need three different things to be present in order for an autoimmune condition or uh, autoimmune issue or full-blown autoimmune disease to occur. The very first thing is you need the genetic predisposition, right? You're not going to develop Crohn's disease if you don't have the genes that are going to you know, predispose you to that. But that's not saying if you have the genes for Crohn's that you're definitely going to develop it. It's dependent upon these next two conditions. The second one is this epigenetic signaling factor or some sort of epigenetic signaling factor. And what do I mean by that? Epigenetics uh, has really been just this field of study that is just saying, like it's really become very popular in the past decade or so. But epigenetics, you can think of this as like, we have the dermis of our skin, but we also have the epidermis of our skin. And this is what lies above our dermis. Epigenetics is what lies above our genetic control. So, you can think about it like this, your genes load the gun, your genes might load the gun, but what's gonna pull that trigger is going to be your environment. Your genes load the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. So your relationships, the food you're eating, the stress you're experiencing, the movement you're doing or not doing, all these things, uh, your sleep you're getting or not getting, the light you're exposing yourself to, all these things are going to pull that trigger. And so we really need more science and studies and you know kind of very well designed uh, interventional studies you know randomized controlled trials and experimental studies like that that are going to show cause and effect right now we have a lot of epidemiology and observational based studies that show an association but we really need a lot better experimental trials done to show this cause and effect but um, you can really think about it like this is that you need the genes so if you're someone out there with Crohn's disease you have certain genes that are basically saying like, okay, you have the genes for Crohn's disease. And if you're experiencing the symptoms, and this is where we could get into like the discussion of ownership. I'm not a big fan of ownership of a disease, like saying it's my Crohn's disease. It's my ulcerative colitis. It's my bad back. It's my bad thyroid. Like, I don't want people, like don't give yourself ownership of that because we say like, that's my girlfriend, that's my dog, that's my t-shirt, that's my fill in the blank, right? What if you said that's the girlfriend or that's the dog, right? You would get in trouble. I would get in trouble if I said that, you know what I mean? So it's like, don't give yourself ownership of your symptoms because you're not intending to keep your Crohn's disease. You're not intending to keep the symptoms that you're experiencing. They're symptoms you're experiencing. And so when it comes to this, you might have genes for symptoms, for a certain condition, for a certain label that you've been given. But it doesn't mean that you need to experience that. If you are experiencing symptoms and you are and you are diagnosed and labeled with Crohn's disease, then that means how you're living your life right now is directly competing with your biology. How you're living your life right now is directly competing against the genes that you have and is quote 
turning on or turning off those genes for Crohn's disease. You can live your life in such a way, eat certain foods, experience types of stress and expose yourself to types of light and relationships and movements and air quality that is going to say, hey, let's turn off these genes for Crohn's disease. And you might not have to experience the symptoms. And that's what this epigenetic signaling factor is, is that you can live your life, you can eat certain foods and you can live your life in such a way that is not going to turn on those genes. Now that is the two. There's one more uh, of these autoimmune triads. There's one more factor that goes into this. And what's been shown for an autoimmune condition to occur, you need to have some form of leaky gut. So you need to have the genetic predisposition, you need to have epigenetic signaling factors, and you need to have some form of leaky gut. And there's so many things that can cause leaky guts, uh, but and there's different types of food, toxins, and so many things, stress, all these things that can attribute to causing leaky gut. But we're gonna talk about those to come, and I talk more about that inside my programs. But this is what we really know to be like a cause or the, the main causes of some form of autoimmune condition to occur. So who is most susceptible when it comes to Crohn's disease? Now this frequently occurs in individuals aged 15 to 35, and most commonly in people with Eastern European or Jewish backgrounds. And like I just mentioned, Crohn's disease is often inherited because of the genetics that we might be predisposed to. Also, those who smoke and live in urban or industrialized areas may have an increased risk for developing Crohn's disease. But this last statistic, that is true across the board because it's been shown that those that live in civilized areas, more industrialized societies, tend to have more autoimmune disease uh, in general. And this is what's coming down to the, the hygiene hypothesis, living like too clean of lives, and this is going to skew our gut bacteria, it's going to skew our microbiome, our hollow biome, you know, our skin's bacteria. We need to get a little bit dirty in the right ways. And I have other videos talking about this that you can check out. So th that's who's most susceptible. So if you're watching this video right now, you might be between the ages of 15 to 35, or if you're not, you might have experienced Crohn's disease symptoms for the first time during these ages here. So what are the symptoms that you could be experiencing? The extreme diarrhea, it could sometimes be bloody. Um, you could have up to t 10 to 20 bowel movements per day. You could be experiencing severe abdominal pain, weight loss, fatigue, and amenorrhea may also occur. But you also might have a moments in your life where you go symptom-free for a little bit, weeks to months, um, but then that's followed up by relapses or flare-ups. And it might be kind of you know difficult to figure out what's causing the flare-ups. Is it food? Is it stress? Is it uh, certain environments that you're exposed to, like what's causing it, right? And so then that might lead you to go to the doctors to get it checked out. And, you know, you might go through many different tests, many different doctors to figure out exactly what's going on, which leads me into, you know, my next point here is how is it diagnosed? How is Crohn's disease diagnosed? Now, it's typically diagnosed with a stool test, uh, colonoscopy or endoscopy, other methods such as CT scans, barium x-rays and MRI scans may be useful to see what is actually happening inside the gut. So if you have Crohn's disease currently, you're labeled with that, then you probably had one of these or maybe all of these uh, tests done to you to figure out what's going on, okay? Now, what are the medical treatments when it comes to Crohn's disease? Crohn's may be treated with medication to help with diarrhea and reduce abdominal spasms. Now, odds are you might be on some form of medication, Humira, or something like that, that is supposed to help you with symptoms, but does it actually get to the underlying root cause? And I, I get it, like when we are desperate for relief from our symptoms, we're about willing to do just about anything to find relief of our symptoms. And if you're here watching this video right now and you're still tuned into this video, then that means you wanna know what those answers are. You wanna know what's going on, what are the root causes, and I wanna lay those out for you to come inside this uh, holistic protocol. The second medical treatment is, um, might be replacing fluids and electrolytes uh, with those with chronic diarrhea. So you might be drinking lots of fluids, you might be uh, incorporating a lot of electrolytes into your system, maybe like IV drips and things like that. Now, the third thing, depending on the intensity of the symptoms, 
antibiotics may be given as well as medications that control the immune system and suppress inflammation. You could also undergo surgery to remove part of the intestine uh, that may be an option for severe cases. Now, during this you know, medical treatment, diet is often not addressed when it comes to this. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, uh, doctors, dietitians, they might give you like a low FODMAP diet, but typically that's going to include uh, still like standard America diet type foods, which is pasta, rice, high fiber foods, um, you know, saying to eat certain types of fats, but avoid other types of fats. And it's so wrong on so many levels because people are not getting better. Maybe they experience a little bit of relief here and there, but they're not getting better. And what I've experienced in my clients and inside my own autoimmune protocols and my programs, people, this is true, like for a majority of them that are serious about this, when they take on a certain protocol and work with me directly, they experience massive relief in as little as like 10 to 11 weeks. And when they are more serious about it and they're more rigid and more structured with their protocol, it's quicker. It really depends on the individual, but uh, you know, and the thing that really makes this unique is that we're not just removing trigger foods that I'm going to talk about, but we are replacing those trigger foods with foods that are nutrient dense that your body needs to actually, you know, function well and produce a good immune system because the foods you eat make up your body. The foods you eat, you know, the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, uh, all those things literally create your neurotransmitters. They create your hormones. They create every cell of your body. They create every cell of your beating heart and your brain, of your liver, of your skin. So it's like, we need to eat nutrient dense foods. And I don't think pastas and rices and breads that you would typically get in a, in a program recommended for IBD, like they're not nutrient dense foods. We don't, we can't, th like we can't thrive off those foods. You know, so many times I work with clients, they will show me what their dietitian from the hospital has given them. And it's just sickening foods that are just making them sicker in other areas. And it's just like, maybe it, gives them temporary relief from their, their digestive issues, but it's like, is there nutrients in that that is giving them the ability to have a healthy brain, have a healthy inflammation response? Uh, you know, often, no. So it's like, we need to replace that with nutrient-dense foods that are going to make your body feel good. So how is Crohn's disease actually corrected? Now, there's a lot that goes into this, and I'm gonna address several here. And then we're gonna jump into your protocol, talking about trigger foods, the best foods to consume, the best supplements to consume, and the best lifestyle practices uh, to practice. So how is Crohn's disease corrected? The very first thing, identify and address any potential leaky gut, infections, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and food sensitivities, especially gluten, soy, dairy, and FODMAPs. You might've heard of FODMAPs before, you might have even been placed on a low FODMAP diet. And I hope your doctor dietitian has explained to you what a FODMAP diet is. But if you're curious, FODMAP just means, uh, it stands for fermentable, oligio, dye, mono, and polyols. So these are just like foods that can get digested, uh, you know, like oligosaccharides, which means uh, it's a certain type of carbohydrates, dye, mono and polyols this is just like you know depending on the 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 starch content or the sugar content it can break down and just cause a, like you know fermenting which can cause irritation in the digestive tract so you're eliminating all those foods that are known you know fodmaps basically so avoiding that that is one great solution but often like i just mentioned you avoid the the fodmap rich foods but then what do you replace it with? You know, usually it's recommended like pastas and rices and breads and things like that, which, you know, we already had that discussion. So identifying this, any potential leaky gut infections, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and food sensitivities. Now I do offer certain tests uh, for my clients uh, if they want the option. It's a hair and saliva test that, you know, you can test for these food sensitivities. You can test for bacterial infections, parasites, molds, Anything like that, it'll give you your food sensitivities. It'll also test for your nutrient imbalances. So that is one option. If you want that, uh, just reach out to me at craig at mccloskeycoaching.com. We can talk more about that. But um, 
Also, potent, uh, addressing potential leaky gut and infections, that is also something you want to address. Now, the second thing, healing the gut should be the top priority. This should be first and foremost. Healing the gut should be the top priority. So what do you do to heal the gut? There's a lot that can be done to heal the gut. And listen, the body is very good at healing itself when under the right conditions. Remember that. The body is really good at healing itself when under the right conditions. If you're constantly feeding it uh, nutrient-poor foods, if you're constantly exposing it to the wrong types of light or experiencing high levels of stress or putting yourself in polluted environments with toxic air and toxic chemicals, toxic cleaning products, uh, this is an abnormal environment. So it's like the body can regenerate itself and heal itself when you just give it the basic building blocks that it needs. And every time we, we you know, try and find this, uh, you know, what is the appropriate like human way of living? You know, it's like always comes back to nature. And this is not hippie whatever. This is just like, that's where we've evolved. That's where we're meant to be. That's where any living thing needs to be. You can look at deer, whales, fish, monkeys, ants, like any, literally any living animal is in nature except for us and the pets that we've domesticated. We are no longer living in nature. We live inside under artificial lighting. We eat foods that we've invented. And then we, for some reason in our guidelines, we say it's okay to eat those foods. We say it's okay to eat those foods where it's like we've never eaten them ever before, right? Not to say you can never have a Snickers or whatever it may be, or Oreos or what's my favorite? I mean, I love ice cream. Like ice cream is my absolute favorite, but dairy does not sit well with me. It's not to say you can never have those. It's just saying like we find ways and excuses and we look for the science that says, oh, that's healthy or like that doesn't impact us that much or like we can have that. But it's like we've forgotten the most basic, most common sense uh, fundamentals when it comes to a living, breathing being. So it's like, you know, we live in this abnormal environment and this abnormal environment is, you know, what's causing a lot of our issues. So it's like only when we can go back to our normal environments are we going to experience a different way of life. So I say all that to say that the body is really good at healing itself when it's placed in the environment that it expects. And so when it comes to healing the gut, what is the environment that the gut expects to heal itself? There's a lot of different uh, foods that we can eat, but a lot of the times it comes down to just avoiding certain foods, you know, because we don't need a lot of different foods to help the gut heal. Now, there's a lot of things that I'm gonna recommend that can help, but uh, healing the gut is gonna come down to largely what you're not eating than what it is that you are eating. Because it's predicated upon what you do eat and the nutrients that you get from you know, amino acids and fatty acids and types of nutrients like that that can directly help repair the gut lining. But if you're still bombarding it with gluten and dairy and all these other trigger foods that I'm going to talk about, then it's not going to heal as, as readily as it should. So healing the gut should be the number one priority. And this can be done through bone broth, collagen, gelatin, which is found in bone broth, L-glutamine, which is an amino acid we're going to talk more about, aloe vera, colostrum, which is great, and other gut healing herbs and nutrients, okay? How else is Crohn's disease corrected? You may need to remove grains, corn, certain high fat foods, sugar alcohols, beans, nightshades, eggs, seeds, and or nuts. Also, watch out for carrageenan, xanthan gum, guar gum, or other additives as possible triggers. Now that's a long list. That's a long list of things to remove or avoid. And there's a certain thing that I wanna mention here is that this might seem restrictive. And inside my program, inside my free seven day autoimmune reset challenge, it's basically you can classify it as like an autoimmune paleo protocol. And this is essentially, if you wanna use the word restrictive, uh, it can be. But here's just kind of like a brief, like little side note about restriction. So I asked the question, is a diet like that really restrictive? Is a diet that just consumes certain foods like that really restrictive? Is that abnormal? Or is having any food available ever, like we have access to grocery stores and any food we could ever want, is that abnormal? So it's like, 
what's the abnormal environment here? Because before all of this, before this environment that we've just created for ourselves, all we had access to was really this autoimmune paleo approach. All we've had access to were these foods that I'm gonna talk about for the most part, right? And is that abnormal? So it's like restriction is really just something that we create inside our heads. Now, it may feel like restriction and deprivation because of the environment we live in. You know, we live in a city and all of our friends uh, are eating certain foods and we go out and we feel like we can't have that because we're following this protocol. Or we go to the grocery store and it's all around us. All these foods are everywhere. So yeah, we're gonna feel like deprived and restricted, but please understand that that is the abnormality. This protocol is not the abnormality. And I have certain tips and takeaways and, and things that you can implement that make this a lot easier to follow um, inside my, my programs. But deprivation and restriction is only created inside of our heads. It's only something that we create inside of our minds based off the way that we see the world. And if you can change your perspective, then you can change those feelings of deprivation and restriction. And so you may need to remove certain things, right? If you want something you've never had, you have to be willing to do something you've never done. So that means you might have to remove a lot of these potential trigger foods and then slowly reintroduce them to see how they impact you, to see if they're causing flare-ups. And when you can do that, then you'll really be the master of your own body. And that's what it comes down to, okay? Also, there, how is this corrected? How is Crohn's disease corrected? You can follow many gut healing diets, like I'm kind of already talked about and that I'm gonna talk more about, but you know, such as paleo, autoimmune paleo, a GAPS diet, a specific car carbohydrate diet, low FODMAP, or any combination of all of this. Um, these can all be extremely helpful in managing symptoms. Now to just kind of reiterate this with some science, like some, some basic, just fundamental thinking, but with hardcore science recommendations. According to a review published in the journal, Expert Review of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, authors found that a low residue diet could be beneficial for reducing flares of IBD patients. Now, low residue diet just means you have low residue coming out, you know, eating foods that are rapidly absorbed and you're not going to have much residue left over, uh, you know, AKA poop. So low residue is what that means. So as you can kind of already think like, what are things that, you know, come out in, in, you know, when you go to the bathroom and usually that's fiber. So what is typically, what we are typically recommended to do is to consume a lot of high fiber foods. And even in IBD patients, you might go to the doctor, the dietitian uh, from the hospital and they will recommend, like I just talked about, a lot of high fiber foods. And in the literature, there's a lot of association. There's a lot of epidemiology and observational based studies that show that eating a high fiber diet with irritable bowel disease improves symptoms. And now if that works for you, great, please keep doing that. But what I've noticed is that a lot of people don't do well with this, especially when it's in the form of the rice and the pastas and the crackers and all these other bland foods that are recommended in these uh, you know, uh, protocols put together. But a low residue diet is just eating foods that are nutrient dense, and this is what I have in my programs, foods that are nutrient dense, that's not going to leave a lot of stress on the colon. Because when you're eating foods that are rapidly absorbed, when you're eating foods that are very nutrient dense, that don't have a lot of insoluble fiber to them, right? Insoluble fiber is like whole grains, nuts and seeds, uh, plants have a lot of insoluble fiber, which means it cannot be digested and it just passes right through everything. And when you're eating a low residue diet and eating foods that don't have a lot of insoluble fiber, that's essentially able to get rapidly absorbed inside the small intestine. And going back to our discussion earlier, Crohn's disease in particular, where is the inflammation? Now, it can be anywhere inside the digestive tract, but it's more in the distal end of the small intestine and in the first part of the, the colon. So if you're able to eat foods that get rapidly absorbed in the small intestine, you're not going to have a lot of residue coming through the parts that are really inflamed. And this is what I've noticed in patients that I've, I've worked with, my clients that I've worked with, is when I put them on this style of, of eating regimen that I have in my programs, 
in the first like two to three days, less bloating, less cramping, less like their symptoms just like are less severe. Uh, they just feel better. And then after we prolong that for several weeks to several months, uh, they just feel a lot better, more energized, their skin, their complexion looks better. So this happens in a large part of individuals that do this the right way. Now there's a wrong way to do this and there's a right way to do this. But in this study that found that a low residue diet could be beneficial for reducing flares of IBD patients, they said, and I quote, the dietary suggestions derived from sources found in this article include nutritional deficiency screening, avoiding foods that worsen symptoms, eating smaller meals at more frequent intervals, drinking adequate fluids, avoiding caffeine and alcohol, taking vitamin mineral supplementation, and I'm gonna talk how to, about how to do that appropriately, eliminating dairy if lactose intolerant, limiting excess fat, and reducing carbs and reducing high fiber foods during flares. So this is basically to say, like this is what I have in my programs and inside uh, my free program, the Seven Day Autoimmune Reset Challenge. To go on, there is a couple more studies that I wanna know, but there was an interventional design study that can show cause and effect that was published in the journal Inflammatory Bowel Diseases. Now, this is actually a very unique study. And here's what happened. There were 15 patients that were enrolled that had been living with IBD for an average of 19 years. Now, these 15 patients had been living with this for almost two decades. A team, including a nutritional therapist and a registered dietitian, led the participants through a six-week phased elimination program to transition from their current diet, the standard American diet, to an autoimmune paleo-style diet. They remained on the full AIP diet for five weeks. The Mayo score, which is a measure of ulcerative colitis activity, or the Harvey Bradshaw score, a measure of Crohn's disease activity, was determined at baseline, so like week zero. Then they tested again after the six weeks of phased elimination and at 11 weeks after a month on full AIP diet. By week six, here's what the researchers found. By week six of following the AIP style diet, clinical remission was achieved in 11 of the 15 study participants. That's 73%. And all 11 of these 15 patients maintained clinical remission during the maintenance phase of the study. How incredible is that? 11 of the 15 saw complete remission of their symptoms following an AIP diet by week six of this 11 week study. The authors concluded by quote, dietary elimination can improve symptoms in endoscopic inflammation in patients with irritable bowel disease. This is crazy. I mean, this is a small population, 15 people. But to have like an experimental trial, you just don't see that in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of individuals. But we can't disregard this. You know, this is something where people saw improvements in just a few weeks time by following this style of diet. So moving on, before we jump to our holistic Crohn's disease protocol, how else can you correct Crohn's disease? What other, you know, factors go into helping to correct this? We need to correct any nutrient deficiencies. You know, iron, usually B12, vitamin D, usually all these nutrients are commonly seen as on the lower end or deficient in individuals with uh, digestive issues because you're not able to absorb uh, a lot of the nutrients that you need. So we need to work, work on correcting any nutrient deficiencies. We also need to maintain adequate hydration with proper electrolytes. We also need to repopulate the gut flora with potent probiotics, which we might need to start doing this a little bit gradually and not just bombarding it with probiotic rich foods or a probiotic. That's something we can work on together if you become a one-on-one -on -one client of mine. And you may need to avoid fructo oligosaccharides or other prebiotics uh, in addition to probiotics at first. Now, this is something that, you know, working with me a little bit one-on-one -on -one can really help to figure this out, what's right for you. But really, you know, Im improving the balance of gut bacteria is something that can really help this. And we're, you know, as Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. And really just trying to figure out, you know, how can we repopulate that gut to help the health of your gut and your overall well-being. Also, stress management and addressing emotional triggers are both very important for disease management. Incorporating regular relaxation, 
meditation, visualization, breathing exercises, emotional freedom technique, which we can talk more about, or restorative yin yoga can be very helpful. Now, this is a holistic protocol, right? We're not just talking about foods, trigger foods, best foods, supplements. We're talking about everything. And that comes down to the way you see yourself, uh, you know, self-image. And uh, do you have self-confidence? And how is your body? Is it relaxed? Are you putting yourself in a, in a relaxed state? Because if you're constantly living in a fight or flight state, your body is not, you're not getting the signals that your body can repair. You need to put yourself in situations in an environment that says, hey, okay, I can relax and I can now take time to repair myself, if that makes sense. And the last thing, we probably should be adding in some omega-3 supplements and maybe some uh, anti-inflammatory supplements like turmeric and curcumin uh, because they can help aid in uh, inflammation levels and just help the overall immune response. So these are all things that we can do to start correcting uh, you know, Crohn's disease in a more natural way. Okay? And this is not to say to stop doing what you're doing with your doctor if you're on any medications. You know, I don't have the power to tell you to do that, nor would I want you to. But you know, if you're going to begin following a protocol like this with foods and natural lifestyle recommendations, I'm just saying medication needs may change. And I would please, please keep working with your doctor very closely because he or she may need to reduce uh, your medications. You might need to change some things. This is not medical advice, and this protocol is not medical advice. But please, you know, just keep working with your doctor closely throughout making any dietary or lifestyle changes. All right, so now that we've really covered the basics and talked about what Crohn's disease is and just kind of gave you the basics of really what, you know, what's going to go on with a, a high quality Crohn's disease protocol, now I want to jump in and actually lay out this holistic Crohn's disease protocol for you so that way you can leave here with tangible takeaways and that you can jump into my free seven day autoimmune reset challenge with a head start. And so this very first thing, like I already talked about, the very first thing that we need to do in order to really help ourselves with any type of issue that we're experiencing, this is to remove all common trigger foods. Remove all trigger foods, okay? And now there's eight different ones here that I wanna talk about, but the very first one is gluten. Now, you might already be following a gluten-free diet or maybe you've heard about it or you wanna try it, but this can really help a lot of individuals because gluten can be very triggering for, for many individuals, and here's why. Gluten triggers what's called zonulin. Zonulin is a protein that has been shown in a 2013 study to directly open and close the lining of the, the small intestines, you know, the tight junctions of the small intestines. So when you ingest gluten, and in this study, this was shown in 100% of individuals tested. So it's not if you're impacted by gluten, it's to what extent. So I might ingest gluten, I might not experience much, but you might ingest gluten and you might feel brain fog, you might uh, develop a skin issue, you might uh, feel severe digestive issues, you might feel achy joints, uh, you know, the food we eat and it can really express itself in many uh, signs and symptoms. And if we're not, you know, paying attention, if we're not conscious of that, then we, it just might go right over our heads and we might not even realize it was because of the food we ate. And in the world that we live in, uh, you know, we're constantly consuming a wide array of foods that we don't even realize what's causing it. We just, you know, we're told that, you know, we're supposed to feel this way. We're supposed to be feeling, you know, it's just a part of the aging process. We're told that, you know, I just get headaches or I just get stomach issues. Like it's just a part of the aging process. This is normal, but it's not. And the problem is these little things, these little signs and symptoms that we experience today, they turn out to be the bigger things later on down the road. And I talk about this in many of my other videos. But when it comes to gluten, this is a problem because if you're eating gluten and it's opening up the tight junctions of your small intestine, right then and there, that's leaky gut. And as we talked about this autoimmune triad, you need to have some form of leaky gut for autoimmune disease or autoimmunity to occur. Because when you're opening up the tight junctions of your gut, you're allowing in not just gluten, you're, not, you're allowing in so many other foreign particles. And the problem with this, with gluten in particular, Gluten is, has what's called molecular mimicry. And when you're ingesting gluten, think about it like this. 
gluten has proteins that are structured in one particular way. Its amino acid sequence, let's just say for example, could be AABB. If you ingest gluten and it opens up your gut lining and it gets into your bloodstream, this sequence of the gluten protein, it looks like AABB. You could be someone, if you have Hashimoto's or if you have Crohn's disease, that certain tissue, say Hashimoto's for example, your thyroid gland could also have a very similar protein sequence like AABB. And your immune system is doing the right thing by attacking gluten. It's attacking that gluten molecule because it can you know, wreak inflammation, cause havoc inside your body. So your immune system is doing a good thing by attacking that gluten molecule. But if you're somebody that is predisposed and has a thyroid that is also AABB, it can attack that thyroid gland, which is Hashimoto's. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, it might start attacking your joints. Crohn's disease, it'll attack you know, your small intestine, large intestine. So this is really coming down to your genetic uh, you know, bio-individuality. You know, what are you predisposed to? And are you exposing yourself to an epigenetic signaling factor? Are you exposing yourself to these foods in this environment? Are you eating gluten that's opening and closing the tight junctions of the gut? So it's like, you can, if you can remove that, then you can, you know, maybe improve your symptoms. It just really depends on your unique bio-individuality. So this is the number one thing to remove. And here's the thing. I want to give you more concrete data to back up what I'm saying. According to a study published in the journal Inflammatory Bowel Diseases, authors noted, quote, testing a gluten-free diet in clinical practice in patients with significant intestinal symptoms which are not solely explained by the degree of intestinal inflammation, has the potential to be a safe and highly efficient therapeutic approach." End quote. This study went on, went on to say basically that when they tested these individuals on a gluten-free diet, they saw relief in their symptoms and they concluded this study by saying it has the potential to be a safe and highly efficient therapeutic approach. So that's just, I mean, Thinking about logically, is there anything in gluten that gives us benefit? Is it nutrient dense? Like, can, do we need gluten to be healthy? So it's like, if we remove it, you know, are we missing out on anything? And the truth is, no, we don't need it in our diets. It's just typically we're told from experts and recommendations that, you know, gluten comes in usually whole grains and things like that. And it's like, we're told we need whole grains because of the nutrients in it. We're told we need whole grains because of the fiber. But if you look into that data, that doesn't hold any weight either. And it's like, maybe some people do well with that and that's fine, but it's like, do you need those things? And if you're somebody out there experiencing uh, digestive issues, you might be experiencing that you don't do well with certain grains or gluten in general. So it's like, okay, we can take that. And are you gonna experience any harm just by removing it for four or five, six weeks, even just one week? Is it going to cause your body harm? And from what I've seen in a lot of my clients and a lot of individuals across the board, no, they get better. So it's worth a try. But what you replace it with has to be of the utmost importance. And that's what I talk about coming up in this, this protocol. And to wrap up this point with gluten, if you're already diagnosed with Crohn's disease and seem to really be impacted by gluten, here's the thing, you may also have undiagnosed celiac disease according to certain studies. According to a meta-analysis published in the prestigious Public Library of Science, Genetics, authors found that, quote, Crohn's and celiac disease can co-occur within families, and studies suggest that celiac disease patients have a higher risk to develop Crohn's disease than the general population, end quote. Now, you might already be diagnosed with both. It just depends, but if you are somebody out there that does not do well with gluten, and you have Crohn's disease, maybe look into getting a test for celiac disease done because you might have something like that going on. Now, this is very common across the board. If an individual has a currently diagnosed autoimmune condition, they are a lot, they have a lot higher likelihood of getting diagnosed with a second or third autoimmune condition. So that's just something to keep in mind, okay? So removing gluten can be a very uh, efficient therapeutic approach according to this data here. So. Moving on to the second food that is a very common trigger food for individuals with autoimmunity. This is dairy. Now, 
dairy is, I mean, most people have really understood that dairy can cause a lot of symptoms and health issues. But for those with autoimmunity and autoimmune, full-blown autoimmune disease, really know that dairy might not sit well with them, okay? And so here's the thing. Many people with Crohn's disease already commonly avoid dairy for the fear that it will cause uncomfortable symptoms such as excess gas, abdominal uh, bloating and cramping, and diarrhea. While it is true that dairy can trigger these symptoms in some people, it's usually because they are lactose intolerant. Now we have data that shows that over 75% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. And lactose intolerant uh, just means that you uh, don't have the lactase enzyme that breaks down lactose, okay? And so people that are lactose intolerant uh, have trouble digesting a type of sugar known as lactose. Lactose is found exclusively in milk and milk products. Humans, we were all born with the ability to break down lactose into smaller, more digestible components. This initial step in digestion is achieved with the help of an enzyme called, like I just said, lactase. Lactase is tailored to break down the lactose molecule into smaller constituents, which are then absorbed by the intestine. So if we don't have this lactase enzyme, we're not able to break down lactose. It, but a lot of us, over 75% of us, lose the ability to produce lactase. So this makes it very difficult for our bodies to digest products containing lactose. As a result, people with lactose intolerance may experience some unpleasant intestinal discomfort when they consume dairy. Myself, I get gassy, I get bloated, I get a sore throat, I, some, I break out sometimes, um, and it's always because of dairy. So, you know, it doesn't mean that I avoid it forever. I just take the hit and, you know, maybe I consume it from time to time. But I make it the exception and not the rule. And so, if you're someone out there with an autoimmune condition, you know, what's it hurt to eliminate dairy? And we're told that we need dairy to make strong bones, uh, get our calcium in, but there's so many other sources of calcium that I recommend inside my programs that you can get by not consuming dairy. And if you're somebody out there that has really impacted dairy, you don't need the nutrients in dairy if you can get them elsewhere in your diet that are going to help your health and not hurt it, okay? So that is the second food that I always recommend that people avoid, limit, or just eliminate entirely for a prolonged period of time while following my autoimmune paleo approach. The third food that I always recommend people avoid, not just with autoimmune uh, issues, but all humans, this is vegetable oils. Now, vegetable oils, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, uh, vegetable oils have just been invented in more for wide scale use in the past 100 years. But we have really found out and through some anthropologic evidence that the ancient Egyptians actually, it was like 5,000 years ago, actually had access to vegetable oils. And those ancient Egyptians that had access to vegetable oils, they developed, uh, they had worse health outcomes, they had more chronic disease, they developed the man boobs. Uh, this is really fascinating stuff, but um, this is what we were finding out, that they were able to process vegetable oils because this isn't vegetables. This comes from industrially processed grain and seed oils. So you really need like high, to, to produce it on the, the mass scale that we have them in today, vegetable oils are things like canola, corn, cottonseed, sunflower, safflower, soybean oil, things like that. And they are literally in everything. You go to any product, 90% of the foods in the supermarket, you're gonna see one of those six vegetable oils. And the thing is, you really need multi-million dollar equipment to take these seeds and grains and press them into an oil. These seeds are not naturally oily. Sunflower seeds, they're not naturally oily. Corn is not naturally oily. All these things, they are not naturally oily. So you can't physically press them into an oil with your hands. You need machines to do that. And when you do that, you use hundreds of pounds of these seeds or grains only to get like a tablespoon or half a cup of an oil. And the problem with this is it's very high in omega-6 fatty acids, and omega-6 fatty acids are very pro-inflammatory. Whereas like omega-3s, like from fish oil, grass-fed beef, they're more anti-inflammatory. And we've evolved to have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 about two to one. We do need omega-6s in our diet. But the problem is, when we're consuming these vegetable oils, we are getting them in excess amounts of 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 50 to 1, depending on the individual. 
And that's the problem with the standard America style diet is that we are getting in excess vegetable oils that are rich in omega-6 fatty acids, particularly linoleic acid, which has been found in so many studies to cause a lot of issues. It's been shown to disrupt our own fat cells, to cause our fat cells to get like fatty fat cells because you can have like fatty liver disease, which is a problem, but you can change the structure of your fat cells, which is, you know, if you're still eating these, you might not be able to burn the fat off you want to because it's rich in this linoleic acid content. So here's the thing with linoleic acid. According to a multi-center study published in the journal Gut, researchers were looking into the connection between linoleic acid and ulcerative colitis. Now this is a study in patients with ulcerative colitis, but this is still irritable bowel disease. They concluded this study by saying, the data support a role for dietary linoleic acid in the etiology of ulcerative colitis. An estimated 30% of cases could be attributed to having dietary intakes higher than the lowest quartile of linoleic acid intake. So what this is saying is that a diet high in linoleic acid could contribute to the cause, etiology, the cause of ulcerative colitis. Do we need vegetable oils in our diet to be healthy? Human history will tell you no, because we didn't have them for most of human history. But just in the past 100 years, there's a lot of good books on this that you can read. And I have a lot of articles and videos talking about this. I talk a lot about it inside my programs, my, my free autoimmune reset program. But the only reason that we are told to eat these vegetable oils is because it lowers cholesterol. It lowers our quote, bad cholesterol, our LDL, which isn't even cholesterol, it's a cholesterol carrier, low density lipoprotein. When you look into that science, you realize that LDL is not the cause of heart disease. It's just there, it's just there. But what is the true culprit is inflammation. You can have LDL that's elevated, as long as it's not inflamed. You know, you can have elevated cholesterol as long as it's not inflamed. You wanna look at other factors, but when it comes to these vegetable oils, they are very uh, oxidative. They're very oxidized in and of themselves because the processing that it, it undergoes, right? It undergoes like 20 to 40 different steps in the processing to degum them, deodorize them. Uh, it just, and then it's turned into an oil and they're very rancid. They're very oxidized. They're sitting in plastic bottles on the store shelves being broken down by light and heat. And then when you ingest that, the fats you consume are, of the they need to be of the highest quality, you know, because if you're consuming oxidized fats, that is directly turning into your skin, your your fat cells, uh, and then what's that doing to your cholesterol? What's that doing to your inflammation levels? We want to consume healthier fats that we've consumed for for as long as humans have really existed, and these vegetable oils have been shown to cause a lot of inflammation, especially in the digestive tract. So, avoiding foods that contain vegetable oils, and the thing is. Like I mentioned, when you avoid vegetable oils, you're basically, by default, you have to avoid like 90% of the things found in the grocery store. So really all you're left with are like whole foods. You're really only left with whole foods from nature. And we can fine tune that even more, but just by eliminating vegetable oils, you're eliminating so many different things, okay? The fourth food that you know we really want to avoid when it comes to causing flare-ups and potential symptoms uh, this is added sugars. Now, added sugars have been on the rise for a few hundred years now. And there's a great book. It's called The Case Against Sugar by Gary Taubes, investigative journalist. This really goes into the history of how we become a culture that consumes like 180 pounds of sugar per year on average. Uh, this is added sugar per year, you know, because people are consuming a carbohydrate, carbohydrate rich diet. People are consuming uh, fruit, but then added sugar on top of all that. It's like through, through sodas through food, like it's just absurd the amount of sugar we're consuming. In the year 1700, we consumed on average like four pounds of sugar per year, added sugar per year. It steadily progressed and then in the 1900s, it just boomed up to like 170, 180 pounds of sh added sugar per year on average per person. And it's absolutely absurd. So if you remove just vegetable oils and added sugars, you're removing like 90 to 95% of everything in the grocery store. 
So it's not to say you can never have these things because added sugars can taste really good, but there's definitely alternatives that you can consume that aren't going to harm your digestive tract, okay? The fifth food to avoid, and this is something I touched on briefly earlier, this is foods high in insoluble fibers. Now there's many different types of fibers. I have a whole lesson dedicated to this inside my free autoimmune reset challenge on fiber intake for individuals with autoimmune disease and digestive autoimmune issues in particular. But insoluble fiber just means this can't be broken down. It's insoluble. Like it, sol when, when uh, fiber is soluble, it means it like completely dilutes in water. It's its solubility content. Something is insoluble, you're still gonna have residue, it's gonna gel up, which can cause some digestive discomfort in a lot of individuals. This is gonna be found in wheat, grains, mostly all vegetables, nuts, beans, and potatoes. So inside this protocol, we are going to limit and eliminate these foods entirely. And what I've seen in clients and patients is that when you limit these foods, symptoms just radically improve in as little as a few days. Now, I can't guarantee that for you because you're a unique individual, but across the board, this is what I've seen. The sixth thing, and this is gonna be a hard one for probably a lot of people, and this is alcohol. Now, I often say, you know, has the pain gotten great enough to where you want to eliminate alcohol? Is your pain great enough to where you want to remove the alcohol? Because if you're not willing to remove something, if you're not willing to give up alcohol, then the pain hasn't gotten great enough yet. And we don't want to get to that point. Alcohol is tricky for a lot of people because it's their, their crutch. They, they go to this when after a long day. They, they, they use this as, you know, it's a habit. And it's like, if you have certain goals, it's okay to give that up. But it's, I have a habit video inside my protocol too and inside all my programs. It's an hour and a half long video talking about uh, the 13 tips on how to uh, build successful habits and how to create successful habits so that way you can give up the things that are hurting you and adopt more of the healthy ones. So alcohol is something that uh, can directly harm the GI tract. And I don't think anyone's really arguing that, but um, definitely giving up alcohol is something that can help with symptom experience. Seven, this is caffeine. This is also something that might be a hard one to give up, but caffeine has been known to irritate the digestive tract for individuals with digestive issues. So giving up caffeine, again, it's similar to alcohol in the terms of like, it's really hard to give up, but if you can undergo like a nice caffeine reset, you can definitely experience uh, some things, you know, a lot of things, whether that's positive or negative. In the short term, it might be negative because you're going through a little bit of a caffeine withdrawal, but giving up caffeine for a week to a month, even if you want to go that far, can really have profound impacts on the quality of your health, energy levels, and more. So this last food that is a known trigger food for individuals with uh, IBD, this is spicy foods. Spicy foods says it right in the name. It's spicy and it hurts. It can cause uh, you know, acid reflux, can cause heartburn, indigestion. And if you're putting these spicy foods into your system, that can cause a lot of uh, harm on the digestive tract. But just kind of asking a fundamental question, why are foods spicy to begin with? This is a defense mechanism by the plant themselves. And I talk about this in other videos, but as any living thing, we need a way to defend ourselves. Animals can run, they have horns, they, you know, puffer fish, they have spikes. Uh, humans, we develop big brains, we develop the ability to create weapons, we have opposable thumbs, we can run, we are really smart. Plants, they're just kind of there. So we assume they're benign, but they don't want to be eaten, right? They're just stuck in the ground. So they need a way to defend themselves too. And many different plants, you know, we know we can't consume most plants. Like you go outside right now and try and eat grass or anything, it'll hurt you if not kill you. Um, but then there's other plants out there, like every, every living thing needs a way to defend itself. And plants are no exception. So uh, spicy foods, you know, the spice, well, like, why do onions make you cry, right? It, there's certain compounds in the onion that make you cry, but that's a defense mechanism that says like, hey, maybe you need to not eat me, uh, but there's certain ways that you, can, that you can prepare these foods to minimize that. And that's what cultures have done for a very long time is they prepare their foods a certain way. So they minimize the chemical content, they, they reduce the amount of anti-nutrients in these plants, they ferment them, they soak them, they sprout them, so that way then they're beneficial. Then they have probiotic, probiotics, they have all these nutrients in them that you can consume and that help your health. So 
spicy foods in general, that's all to say that spicy foods are spicy because that's basically saying like, hey, maybe you shouldn't eat me like this and we need to prepare them a certain way. So reducing spicy foods is another way to potentially help uh, your Crohn's disease symptoms. All right, so now moving on in your holistic Crohn's disease protocol, I wanna talk about the foods that you can and should consume to have a healthier body, healthier immune response, and just overall higher quality of life, okay? These are the eight foods that you should consume. The very first one is high quality protein. This is grass-fed meat, wild-caught fish, organic chicken, and pastured pork. These are animal sources of protein, and these are by far the most bioavailable sources of protein according to uh, the DIAS score, according to uh, when, you, when you test protein, when you test amino acids, you'll see that certain amino acids from certain sources are better digested, better assimilated inside the body. And these will all come from grass-fed meats, wild-caught fish, chicken, and pasture pork. But now here's the thing when it comes to these protein sources from animal foods. In the mainstream, in conventional, uh, this conventional setting, if you go to your doctor, like we talked about at the beginning of this episode, your doctor or dietitian, they might give you a list of foods to eat. Animal foods are on the list of foods not to eat, and they are on the foods to avoid because of epidemiology, because of observational data. In observational data, which is basically just surveying a large part of the population, in that data, in these studies, it'll show that meat intake is associated with worse Crohn's disease outcomes. But often, this is what's known as the healthy and unhealthy user bias. And I have a great discussion on this in certain other videos, but I'll touch on it briefly here. In our world today, in our society, how is meat commonly consumed? How do we commonly consume meat? It's usually on a pizza, pepperoni. It's usually with processed foods. It's usually with vegetable oils. It's usually by individuals that are smoking. It's usually by individuals that don't care about the quality of their food. It's so readily available. You can buy meat anywhere. You, it's usually processed. It's usually conventionally raised meat. And this data, this epidemiology data, this observational data, this is not something that can account for any of that. What this does is they give individuals a questionnaire, they give them an intake form, hundreds of thousands of individuals, they give them these forms. And they will ask them to recall the food they've eaten in the past few days, few weeks, few months, whatever it may be. And what they do is they make associations. They draw associations from this food and then they ask them also about their symptoms, the diseases and things like that. And so when this happens is they'll be like, oh yeah, the more meat someone consumes, the higher likelihood they have of experiencing Crohn's disease or symptoms. And what they can't distinguish in those studies is what type of meat that was. Was it high quality meat? Was it grass fed meat? Was it consumed with you know, vegetable oils? Is the person a smoker? Uh, how they live their quality of lives? What's their stress levels? Do they prioritize sleep? Do they move healthfully? Like all these things can't go into that. And so, yeah, it's gonna look like meat is exacerbating the symptoms. But what has the narrative been the past 70 years? The narrative of health and health conscious individuals, the narrative of the past 70 years is that meat is bad, saturated fat is bad, that vegetables are good. So in these studies, observational based studies, epidemiology, when it comes down to this, when they do these studies and they ask health conscious individuals, uh, health conscious individuals are more likely to eat plants and produce and probably limit the meat consumption because it's deemed as bad. So in these studies, individuals that don't consume meat, it's going to look like their health outcomes are because they avoid meat, but they're probably also sleeping better. They're probably also uh, managing their stress levels healthfully. They might be of a, a higher financial status. They just might be doing a lot of other things right. They might be exercising and doing yoga and running and avoiding a lot of the, the modern day processed foods. But they're also probably maybe limiting meat consumption. So is it the lack of meat consumption that attributes to better health outcomes? Or is it just because of the narrative? Because then the unhealthy user bias, that was the healthy user bias. The unhealthy user bias is 
people that aren't really health conscious, they're probably more likely to consume meat, but they're probably also consuming it with all the other processed foods and doing all the other unhealthy lifestyle factors. So is it the meat that's the problem or is it everything else that usually comes along with it? So I asked the question is, what if you have a health conscious individual that consumes meat, but also is exercising regularly, prioritizing their sleep quality, managing their stress levels appropriately, engages in you know, healthy relationships, has a true sense of purpose and drive in their life, exposing themselves to the right types of light. What if you have an individual like that? You just don't see disease outcomes in the data like you would. So it's like, now you can do this for yourself. You can eat certain foods and if you feel better without meat, I ask you, that's fine. Like that's a completely fine if you do. But it's also like, if, are you, do you usually consume it with processed foods? If so, is it the processed foods or is it the meat, right? The only pr concern I have about this when it comes to avoiding meat is that, like I just mentioned, it's a high quality source of protein. It contains a lot of nutrients. It's not just protein. Like a thing of beef is not just protein. There's a long list of nutrients in it. Dozens and dozens and dozens of nutrients in it. And just this little piece of beef, you can get so many nutrients that turn into your hormones, that turn into your neurotransmitters, that help your health, that give you energy. And so there's so much in that, that it's not just, you know, protein. So it's like, I just get very concerned when people are avoiding that, that they're missing out on all these nutrients. And so with that being said, consume high quality protein. You need to consume high quality protein for your body because if you're someone out there with the digestive condition like Crohn's disease, celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, your absorption is probably already not optimal. So it's like you are at a higher risk of mal malnourishment, malnutrition. So it's like you need to get in protein. We've sought out protein in nature and the most readily, readily available source of protein in any environment is animal protein. Any culture you go to, no matter where you go, animal protein is always readily available for the most part. You know, what are plant sources of protein? Beans, uh, grains, which is grains we've only began cultivating in the past 10,000 years, but that's not available in every culture. But what is readily available is animal sources of protein. And almost by evolutionary accident, have we come to consume these things? But we've come to consume them in a completely different way than we consume them now. We don't consume, we haven't consumed them like we do now. You know, it's what we could hunt and then we consumed it uh, the animals were living a healthier quality of life too. So it's like, we have to remember what it was like before this abnormal environment. I have many other videos talking about this more in depth. So you can refer to those. I talk more about this inside my programs, but just understand that high quality protein, you need to get it in. And if you're somebody out there that doesn't feel well with meat consumption, uh, just discern, is it the meat that you don't feel well with or is it usually what you're consuming that meat with that you don't feel well with? So hope that makes sense. Number two, foods to consume. This is bone broth. Bone broth is great because it contains so many beneficial nutrients that we need to produce healthy joints, healthy skin, healthy hair, healthy nails, a healthier digestive tract, collagen, gelatin, uh, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin. There's so many nutrients in bone broth that are so beneficial for our overall health. And this is something that I recommend to consume at least every day or multiple times every day while you're undergoing this autoimmune paleo approach to this holistic Crohn's disease protocol because this is something that can really help to heal and seal the digestive lining of the gut. So that is the second food that I would highly recommend consuming. Inside my, my autoimmune reset protocol, I have a cookbook in there like I mentioned that has several different bone broth recipes, beef bone broth, chicken bone broth. There's a nice avocado soup bone broth recipe. There's a seafood stew that uses chicken bone broth. Uh, there's so many different broths and soup recipes in there that make them taste really freaking good. So definitely check that out and make it easy for you. And I definitely recommend getting more bone broth into your diet right away. So the third food, this leads me into this third food that you should consume regularly. And this is organs, organ meats, awful, 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 however you want to say it. Organ meats, I know you're probably like, eh, no way, drawing the line there. 
But here's the thing. When we are doing an autoimmune paleo protocol, when we are removing foods, right? I talked about that extensive list of foods that we need to remove, right? A lot of the, the grains and a lot of uh, certain plant foods that contain insoluble fiber, right? You're being more restrictive just by nature. You're, you're eliminating a lot of these foods. So you need to get your nutrients in somewhere and anywhere in the world. Like organ meats are by far the most nutrient dense foods that you can consume. And if you're just going to consume one, just make it liver. But organ meats are by far the most nutrient dense foods. So what's the point in removing gluten, like following gluten free diets, if you're just going to replace it with other foods that might harm your body in other ways? Because that's often what people do. They follow a gluten free approach. They go buy, you know, box packaged, prepackaged goods that say gluten free on it, but they're just consuming other foods that might spike up their insulin even more, that might uh, throw their hormones out of whack. But it's gluten free, so it's healthy, right? You know, so it's like we need, if we're gonna remove something, we need to replace it with nutrient dense foods. That's what I do inside my programs is I help people to understand that it's not just enough to remove the trigger foods, but what you replace it with is also you know, of the utmost importance. And replacing it with high quality protein, bone broth, and organ meats is by far like the best thing that you can do for your health. So now moving on to the fourth food that you should consume while following this holistic Crohn's disease protocol. This is medicinal mushrooms. Now, if you're new to this, you might be like, what, mushrooms? Like, I thought mushrooms were only something that I could get on my pizza or the things that Channing Tatum were smoking in 21 Jump Street. There's a lot of different types of mushrooms and there's a class of mushrooms called medicinal mushrooms. There's culinary mushrooms that you would get on your pizza. There's psychedelics that Channing Tatum used in 21 Jump Street. But there's also this class of mushrooms called medicinal mushrooms. And these have very medicinal like properties to them that have been used and documented uh, usage for thousands of years. And we even have modern day science affirming their efficacy today. And believe it or not, a lot of, it's like 40% of pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical drugs are derived from fungi, from plants, from fungus and mushrooms or fungi. So medicinal mushrooms have been used for a very long period of time. And we share about 50% of our DNA and it's like 80% of our RNA with mushrooms. We're very closely related. That sounds weird, but it's like, it's backed up in the data. And this is something that is just like, we have been consuming these for a long time and it's like we need to respect that. And they have a lot of efficacy when it comes to autoimmune issues in general because all medicinal mushrooms help to regulate the immune system. They are immunomodulators. If, you're on, if you have Crohn's disease or you have some sort of autoimmune condition, chances are you might be on an immunosuppressant drug because your immune system is hyperactive. It's overactive and your immune system is attacking you. So you might have been prescribed an immunosuppressant to calm your immune system down. Whereas like maybe if you're somebody that gets colds often or whatnot, you might have been you know, prescribed an immunostimulatory drug. It ramps up your immune system. What these medicinal mushrooms do is they are immunomodulating, like I said. And there's certain ones that are better than others that I'm going to talk about. But immunomodulating means if you're somebody that has an autoimmune condition like you might, this can help you to lower your immune system back at the set point at which it expects. If you're somebody that is commonly getting colds often, this can help to raise your immune system back up to the point at which it expects. So very intelligent and there's a lot of data to back this up. In terms of irritable bowel disease in particular, there is one mushroom in particular that has just stood out in the science that is shown to be very beneficial for Crohn's disease and IBD in general. Now, one of the major causes of IBD is reactive oxygen species, or ROS. A buildup of ROS are what leads to oxidative stress. This is what we don't want. This is like metal rusting inside the body. We don't want oxidative stress uh, that is chronic. A little bit is fine because we need it to help heal infections, but we don't want inflammation to run wild. Oxidative stress leads to things like inflammation and damage of cellular structures. Having a high ROS is basically a byproduct that is sure to occur when the flare-up is triggered. So when you're experiencing a flare-up of Crohn's disease or whatever autoimmune condition you have, you can be sure that your ROS, your reactive oxygen species, is elevated. 
The way to cancel these ROSs out is with antioxidants, right? This is antioxidation, right? Reactive oxygen species, this is oxidation inside the body. The way to cancel that out is antioxidants. Now, there's several things that we can do to improve oxidation inside the body. To, we can ingest antioxidants, right? As a little side plug, antioxidants, we think of like blueberries or colorful fruits and vegetables. By nature, by basic biochemistry, those are pro-oxidants. Like if you look at the chemical structure of the anti, quote unquote, antioxidants of like blueberries, they're actually pro-oxidants because they couldn't exist in themselves if they were antioxidants, they're pro-oxidants. Where they get their name and term antioxidants is because when you ingest them, they trigger your body's own antioxidant defense systems, namely glutathione. Glutathione is the master antioxidant uh, of our bodies. And so there's many things that we can do to trigger our body's own uh, production of glutathione. Uh, ingestion of these antioxidants, quote unquote, antioxidants from foods, or we can, eat, uh, we can do fasting, we can adopt a ketogenic style diet because ketones trigger glutathione. We can engage in cold thermogenesis, like a cold shower or a cold ice bath. Um, we can do uh, saunas, like heat shock proteins, they help to ramp up glutathione. There's a lot of, uh, of this hormesis that we can engage in. Hormesis is basically what doesn't make you, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And hormesis, it, we need a little bit of it. It's like lifting weights, right? Uh, exercise is a great way to boost glut glutathione. So it's like, we need a little bit of stress only to make us come back stronger. So we have environmental hormesis and we have molecular hormesis. Environmental hormesis is what I just said, ice baths, saunas, uh, fasting, ketogenic diets, and you know things like that. Molecular hormesis is through foods like this. And when it comes to medicinal mushrooms, one mushroom in particular, chaga mushroom, has been shown to have the highest antioxidant capacity of any known food that we know about. Chaga's ORAC score is through the freaking roof. This ORAC score is oxygen radical absorbance capacity. And this is something that is very commonly used by the NIH, uh, the National Institute of Health and Aging. So this is very reputable. Like the ORAC value, like determining this is very reputable. When chaga was measured, and it has to be dual extracted, when it's dual extracted chaga, I'll explain what that means in a moment, its ORAC score was over 113,000, which when that's compared to other known high antioxidant foods that you and I might know about, now chaga was 113,000, the next highest, was raw cacao, so this is raw chocolate, at 26,000. You can see the massive difference. Acai, 18,500. Dark chocolate, 13,000. Prunes, 5,700. Blueberries, 2,100. So you can see when chaga was dual extracted, its ORAC score is through the roof. So what that is doing is you're ingesting a lot of these antioxidants that are able to, quote, put out that fire, that inflammatory fire, put out the ROSs. And so when it comes to chaga helping with Crohn's disease and irritable bowel disease, here's what a recent study said, quote, chaga mushroom extract inhibits oxidative DNA damage in lymphocytes of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Here's the thing. Lymphocytes were obtained from 20 IBD patients and 20 healthy volunteers. The researchers used hydrogen peroxide to induce oxidative damage in both of these groups of individuals. This is in vitro. In vitro means in living humans, which is basically in study terms, like that's high quality science right there. When they gave both groups the same amount of chaga extract to like help this DNA damage, here's what they found. Quote, chaga supplementation resulted in a 54.9% reduction of hydrogen peroxide induced DNA damage within the patient group, 34.9% within the control group. Lymphocytes from Crohn's disease patients had a greater basic DNA damage than ulcerative colitis patients. And the researchers went on to conclude this study by saying, chaga extract reduces oxidative stress in lymphocytes from irritable bowel disease patients and also healthy individuals when challenged in vitro. Thus, chaga extract could be a possible and valuable supplement 
to inhibit oxidative stress in general. I'm just reporting the science. I don't make this up. I'm just saying this is absolutely absurd. And this makes sense because chaga has a super high uh, ORAC score. Its antioxidant capacity is through the freaking roof. And like I said, it needs to be dual extracted when you consume this. And you're probably thinking like, how can I consume these? Like, how can I get chaga? Like, is it going to taste bad? Is it going to taste like mushrooms? Here's the thing. I consume this almost every single day, usually every single day, five days out of the week uh, on a bad week. And this is because I get them from a company called Four Sigmatic. Now they are doing things the right way. They are dual extracting all their mushrooms. And what they're doing is they're putting them in things like coffee, teas, protein powders, uh, teas, like things like that, that you're already consuming. So it makes them very easy to get these in and they taste really good. Like I love the coffees. I love the teas. In your case, if you're avoiding the coffees, you can do teas, you can do protein powders, you can do chocolate. They have chocolate and they're putting this in, in all these things and it tastes really, really good. So I highly recommend them because they're, like I said, doing the dual extraction method. They're doing the hot water and the alcohol extraction method. So you can use code Craig at checkout and you can get epic discounts on any of their products all the time. And they're always running great deals and they really you know, like to hook people up. They're always sending free stuff to me and a lot of people that I recommend them to. So I definitely would check out Four Sigmatic. My favorites, like I said, are the coffee, uh, the teas, the protein powders, the peanut butter protein powder is so freaking good. Um, they have these little wellness shots. You can do like little think shots. You can do uh, these little elderberry shots that have mushrooms in them. Really good. But I highly recommend checking out Chaga Mushroom because it is just phenomenal for uh, a lot of different autoimmune conditions and you're really gonna love them, I know. So check them out, use code Craig at checkout. Now moving on to the fifth food that you should be consuming in a proper holistic Crohn's disease protocol. This is fresh pressed vegetable juices. Now a lot of juices on the market like these naked brands and things like that, they're just gonna contain like 40 to 50 grams of sugar in a bottle and that's going to do a lot more harm than good. So you wanna make sure that you do it fresh, either get it from a reputable company that doesn't have much sugar in it or you're doing it yourself using like 80% vegetables and just a little bit of like citrus fruits or things like that. That's going to keep that sugar content to a minimum. But this can be a great way to just kind of help cleanse the digestive tract, still get in a lot of bioavailable nutrients and they usually taste really good. I like adding a little bit of mint, maybe a little bit of citrus fruits in there and using like a cucumber as a base and celery as a base. It tastes really good. So definitely check that out. Number six, of these eight foods to consume on your holistic Crohn's disease protocol. These are foods high in probiotics. This is things like sauerkraut, kombucha, pickles, and also avoiding unnecessary antibiotics when possible because we kind of talked about already, you need to have uh, gut bacteria that's in you know certain balance, right? If we have gut dysbiosis, and most of us do have some sort of dysbiosis because we are consuming uh, antibiotics, like rounds of antibiotics needlessly, and we are consuming a lot of these processed foods. We're doing a lot of things that's causing our gut bacteria just to uh, you know, take a hit and having chemical cleaning products in our house and all these things can really harm our microbiome. Now there's been a lot of evidence that suggests that including more probiotics and just correcting uh, gut dysbiosis can really improve uh, IBD symptoms. I talk all about that and all the science in my free autoimmune reset challenge. So check that out. Seven of eight foods to consume. This is fruits. Fruits can be amazing. Uh, what I typically recommend when it comes to fruit consumption is make sure they're lower glycemic and make sure they're local and in season. And you know that way they're gonna taste better, they're gonna be fresher. That's kind of what your biology expects is to consume foods that have been grown in your local area. This can be berries, this can be avocados, uh, bananas, things like that. So I highly recommend consuming fruits because they are, they are so beneficial and as long as you're you know, consuming them, you should be fine. You know, Minimal people experience digestive issues with this, but if you do, you know, just limit it for a certain time being, incorporate it after and see how you feel. And this last food to consume is healthy fats. Now we need fats. We have essential fatty acids that we need to consume. So this is gonna be things like uh, grass-fed animal fats, tallow, lard, as well as like coconut oil, grass-fed butter, avocado oil and olive oil, as well as like fish oils and fatty fish like that. So consume healthy fats, but here's the caveat. A lot of people with digestive issues, if you try and do too much fat at once, when you're changing things around, 
you might experience like, you know, what we call disaster pains. You might experience like loose stools, have digestive discomfort. And if you're not used to consuming fats because you've been told that a high fat diet can worsen digestive issues like Crohn's disease, ulcer, colitis, celiac disease. So if you've been someone that has not been consuming a lot of fats because you've been told that consuming a high fat diet can worsen your digestive issues, you might experience some, some issues at first, just kind of reaffirming those beliefs. But what it comes down to is avoiding the vegetable oils, avoiding the high fat processed foods, but incorporating more of these healthy fats into your diet, cooking with them, jizzling them on any foods that you want. Um, but at first, if you start doing this too much too fast, you might experience some issues because your bile production that helps to emulsify these fats, you might not have high bile production inside your, your gallbladder and liver to where you're not able to break down these fats. So it's just gonna take a little bit of time. So start small with these fats, just a little bit, but we do need fats because we have essential fatty acids that we need to produce energy, to these, we have structural fats like omega-6s and omega-3s to create a healthy brain and create the tissues in our body and produce energy. So getting in these healthy fats is another great food to consume on this holistic Crohn's disease protocol. Now moving on and really wrapping up this protocol, I wanna talk about the five best supplements that you can consume and that you should consume if it's right for you and please work with your doctor. These are the best supplements to consume for Crohn's disease. Now the very first one, this is fish oil. Now fish oil helps to reduce inflammation and really anyone with any inflammatory conditions should consider consuming a fish oil supplement. But typically what I recommend is looking for ones that have at least this, 480 milligrams of EPA and at least 360 milligrams of DHA a few times per day, like two to three times per day. There's a lot of great recommendations that I have on my supplement dispensary. I have a full script account. This is just a way to ensure that you're getting a lot of high quality supplements uh, at affordable costs. I you know, hook my uh, clients up and anyone that goes through my dispensary, you don't have to be a one-on-one -on -one client. All you have to do is go to the link below and you can check out my supplement dispensary, check out my favorites. And it's really just a way that you can get high quality supplements that you can trust from reputable brands that have been stored properly. So you can make sure that these fish oils aren't rancid or oxidized because if you're going to the store and you're just buying a random fish oil off the shelf, um, that's been sitting in that store shelf being broken down by light and heat. And then that fish oil, because they are polyunsaturated fats, the fish oil is very polyunsaturated, so it gets oxidized very easily. So we want to make sure they're stored properly, and that's what Full Script does. And it's just a way for you know health professionals to get better quality supplements into the hands of their patients and clients. So you can check that out. You can go to us.fullscript.com forward slash welcome, forward slash McCloskey. You, or you can just click that link below, it'll be a lot easier. You can access it there and you'll automatically receive 15 to 35% off of everything in there and you get free shipping on orders over $50. Check that out, you will love it. But all these supplements here, you can get on there. You can see my favorite brands, you can see my Crohn's disease protocol on there and just grab it for yourself and restock up when you need. You don't need my permission. You can just go on there anytime you want and do it. Or you can email me. You can become a one-on-one -on -one client, receive more discounts, and I can prescribe you know, recommended supplements for you willingly at your request. So the second supplement that I recommend for Crohn's disease, this would be a high quality probiotic. Now, Crohn's disease may be related to an imbalance of healthy bacteria in the gut and chronic diarrhea may exacerbate this problem. So you know, getting the bacteria. Bacteria control everything. We need a healthy balance and have a, a correct that dysbiosis in there. So probiotics can be amazing, but really they're just like a drop in the bucket. And when it comes to all the trillions of bacteria that you have in your gut. So that's why I'm a fan of including probiotic rich foods, eliminating a lot of the toxic chemicals that can destroy your gut bacteria, but also getting outside, getting dirty in the right way, not being over sanitized, but also incorporating a probiotic uh, supplement can really do wonders for a lot of people. And I just recommend at least 10 billion colony forming units. These are CFUs, at least 10 billion. You can go up to 100 billion or even more of a high quality probiotic supplement. So definitely check that out. The third supplement that I recommend for Crohn's disease, this is L-glutamine. Now this is an amino acid that has been shown in many studies to help repair leaky gut. And typically what I recommend with L-glutamine is about 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams twice daily for a structured regimen when it comes to healing uh, the gut lining. 
and you can get this in foods, uh, bone broth and things like that can, is going to contain L-glutamine. But supplementing is another great way to just really up your glutamine levels. So that's what I would recommend there. The fourth supplement that I recommend, this is a high quality multivitamin and I stress the high quality part. Now, you, if you're somebody out there that has had digestive issues, that has had chronic bouts of diarrhea, uh, odds are you might be at risk for malnourishment. And here's the thing, you can be overweight and you can be obese and you can have excess fat on your frame and still be at risk for malnourishment because your body does not crave calories per se. Your body craves nutrients. And when your colon and digestive tract is chronically just being bombarded and you're not able to absorb those nutrients, uh, you're not able to get the nutrients that you need. So you could be at risk for malnourishment. So incorporating a high quality multivitamin in a strategic way while following a protocol like this can ensure that you're absorbing the nutrients that you need in the most bioavailable forms possible. Because a lot of these centrums and just random multivitamins on a store shelf that are cheap, they don't come in the forms that your body can use because there's so many different forms of vitamins and minerals uh, you know, you need them in specific forms. And if you've checked out my ebook, Smarter Supplementation, I talk all about this in there. So you can check that out on my website. But what I really recommend is getting a high quality multivitamin. And I recommend a few different ones on my full script account. So you can go there and again, check that out. But usually I just recommend one per day with food. And that will really help to uh, get your nutrient levels back up. Food first, but supplement when needed. Now the last supplement here, this fifth supplement that I recommend for Crohn's disease, this is aloe vera juice. And this is a food, but this is a supplement that I recommend you can put in your smoothies and you can just drink it straight. You can do whatever you wanna do with it. Uh, but this is great because it really helps to heal the gut. And if you think about it, aloe vera, like it's like a gel-like consistency, that's really gonna to help to gel up your, your small intestines that can help uh, you know, kind of cool and calm that inflammation down. But I usually just recommend half a cup, two times daily, Mix it into your smoothies, into your foods, whatever you want to do. But I just recommend getting this in because it can really help. And a lot of clients have, uh, you know, a lot of individuals have really seen a lot of great improvements with aloe vera. Now, wrapping up this protocol altogether, there are six lifestyle practices that I recommend when it comes to Crohn's disease. And this very first one is make sure you're getting in regular movement. We all know what it's like to get in regular movement and how that can help to regulate our digestive system. When you go for a nice walk, you usually work up a good bowel movement. So regular movement, walking and stretching and light, easy movement if that's where you're at. I have sample workouts inside my free autoimmune reset challenge. More than welcome to do that. They're certified personal trainer formulated. And those workouts are going to help you to move your body more in ancestrally consistent ways. So I definitely recommend, you know, just moving your body a little bit more, checking those out if you can. Number two, the next best lifestyle practice that you can do that's going to help your gut motility, this is going to be manage your stress in a healthy way. We all know that when we're stressed out, either we have worse bowel movements, either more constipation or more diarrhea, but this has been shown in the literature many times over that stress can just cause so much havoc inside of our guts. Uh, so really finding ways to manage your stress, whether that's through meditation, breathing, uh, you know, exercise, anything like that, talking, uh, talk therapy, uh, you know, avoiding stress in the first place, you know, and just making sure that your stress is just of the utmost, you know, importance that you're managing it in a healthy way. The third thing that kind of ties into this, this is to focus on deep breathing and meditation. This is something that can just help you to manage your stress levels, which can also put you more into that rest and digest parasympathetic state that's going to take you out of that sympathetic fight or flight response so your body can actually absorb the nutrients so that way you can actually you know just digest your food and you know have better bowel movements that's what i would recommend there the fourth thing this fourth lifestyle practice this is develop a gratitude mindset develop a gratitude mindset i think there's nothing more we need to talk about there but having a gratitude mindset is just a great way uh, to really Remember all that you have in life. Remember that you're good enough because this is a holistic protocol. And this is something that, you know, self-confidence and the way you see yourself and self-esteem, um, it can really take a toll on you, you know, a digestive issue. And just remembering all that you're grateful for every day. First thing in the morning, throughout the day, and then definitely 
right before you go to bed at night, put into practice having this gratitude mindset. The fifth thing here, this fifth lifestyle practice, expose yourself to more natural light. And this is something that I'm just gonna to touch on briefly. I have other videos talking all about this, but we have what's called our circadian rhythm. You've probably heard about this because it's really made a lot of headway in the mainstream in the past five years or so. But we also have circadian nutrition. We are meant to eat at certain times of the day. And when we eat at certain times of the day, uh, hopefully at the right times of the day, when the sun is still out, that's going to help our digestion. That's going to help our absorption of our nutrients. So the key takeaway here, just make sure that you're exposing yourself to as much high quality sunlight as you can, less artificial lighting through screens and through uh, TVs and you know the lighting in your house, making sure you're getting outside as much as possible. But also, if you can eat your food outside while it's daylight and avoid eating your food at night when it's dark out, that can be one thing that can really just be a game changer for you. So I'll talk more about this inside my protocol, but this is just something that I think can really help you uh, when it comes to Crohn's disease and autoimmune conditions in general. So that was your holistic Crohn's disease protocol. I hope you enjoyed it and got a lot of takeaways. Let me know your favorite takeaway or many takeaways in the comment section below. I would love to get a conversation going, but if you want more practical advice and just takeaways that you can implement right now, head on over, click that link below and check out my free seven day autoimmune reset challenge. Definitely take that on. There's a lot of content in there. And at the end, I have a lot of paid programs that go into even more in-depth information than this video and in that free program. I'm here to give to you, here to serve, and I really hope you enjoyed this and my content. I look forward to talking with you next time. My name is Craig McCloskey, and I'll talk with you soon.